Hello, um, I'm super happy to be here, or not so happy. Um, I would prefer to talk about something else, but you know, we do what we can, right? So, um, first we have to start with the basics. I'm not here on behalf of Illusory, which is the company behind Nomad. So the views I express are my own and do not reflect those of the company. As it's an active uh, investigation right now, an active incident, we will be not doing any Q&A, unfortunately. Um, my name is Odysseus. I'm a protocol engineer in Nomad. I've worked in Web3 as a consultant, and I've also been working as a DevOps and IoT. So today we'll be talking about Nomad, what is Nomad, how the protocol works. We will need that to be able to talk about bridges, and how they work, and the incident. And finally, what are the learnings we have? What did we learn from losing about uh, having a hack that resulted in $190 million in tokens being evaporated. Nomad is not a bridge. Nomad has a bridge, right? But if Nomad is not a bridge and has a bridge, what's Nomad? Nomad is an optimistic protocol, first of all, which means that it has an optimistic security model. It's a, it's a protocol for interoperability, which means that it allows applications to be able to meaningfully react to an event that happens in another blockchain, right? Meaningfully, that's super important. We don't define how uh, your application will react to some event. Basically, the Nomad protocol would just send arbitrary bytes from one dom domain to another. So it's you, the developer, to interpret those bytes. So Nomad is an optimistic protocol for interoperability that supports arbitrary messages between domains. How Nomad works. The first thing you have to know about Nomad, and probably the last, um, it's that it's super simple. On the sending chain, all the messages that are being sent, they're added to a metal tree, right? So, and why we do that is because it's very easy with a metal tree to prove whether a message belongs to the tree or not. The information of inclusion, in theory and in practice, is included, is compressed into the root. So the protocol only ha it only has to do is to send that root from the sending chain to the receiving chain. If we do that securely, then anyone can go to the receiving chain and prove that the message indeed belongs to the tree uh, that has that root. So all that the protocol does really is just uh, passing this root from the sending name domain to the receiving domain. Domain is a chain, right? Let's see the life cycle of a message nomad. First, we go to the home contract. Uh, if you, you see here the home contract on the sending chain, and we send the message, right? Then a new route is generated. Then that route is relayed to the receiving chain, and it will find itself in a contract called replica. Then we must wait for the optimistic window to pass. Afterwards, we can go to replica to the receiving domain and say, hey, Here's the, uh, the proof of inclusion. Here is the message. I want to prove that this message was indeed sent. And after we prove a message, we can process it. And when we process a message, basically uh, the replica contract will take the message uh, metadata, call the contract uh, destination contract, and pass the message payload. Super simple. Now that we have, in a very basic sense, how understand how Nomad works, let's talk, talk about bridges. What's a bridge? A bridge is a super simple application built on top of any interoperability protocol. Basically, you go to uh, the sending chain, right? let's say Ethereum, you go to the contract and say, hey, bridge, I want to send my native tokens with, for example. It's a native token to Ethereum. It has intrinsic value. And I want to send it to, to Evmos, right? Then the bridge will hold that uh, with, and it will send a message to the receiving chain to the uh, nomad bridge at the receiving end and say, hey, you should mint, you should create a new MADWIF, a representation token, which doesn't have any, any value in itself. The value is derived from the fact that we can do the opposite. That the user that holds the MADWIF can go to the bridge and say, hey, I want to burn that token. And I want to transfer my MADWIF back 
into Ethereum. So the bridge will send a message back and say, hey, unlock a new width. A hack is when the, all this locked collateral in the bridge is stolen, right? So now all these representations that are flying around, they're essentially worthless because they can't be redeemed for the original asset, for the asset has intrinsic value. And I think that's why we have we've seen so many hacks in bridges, not only because they are indeed complex systems, and they are, but because also they have so much collateral locked inside them. They're very juicy targets. They make good targets for hackers to pry and test for the vulnerabilities. Let's talk about the incident. What, how was the Nomad Bridge possible to be hacked? We'll talk about two mappings in the replica contract. Two mappings was all it took. The first mapping connects a route to the timestamp that says that after that timestamp, that route is indeed valid. You can start proving messages against the route, the route of the Merkle tree. Right. So a new route comes and a new timestamp is generated. So when, now uh, I can go to the replica and if the time, time has passed, I can say, hey, here's the message. Here's the proof. I want to prove it against a valid route. And if that happens, then the message is proven. Now the message, con and uh, when proving a message, you connect the, uh, the message, which is about 32, to the root, which was proven under solidity and the default values of my pins. All the, the default value for a byte 32 is zero, and for a number is zero as well. So in a way, if you look at the second mapping here, in a way, all messages are proven under the zero root, proven. But of course, in the code, we, uh, you know, we, we, we set an authentication flow that said that, of course, this is not a valid, uh, of course, this is zero. And if the, uh, the timestamp is zero, then it's not valid because also the number zero is the default value. The problem is that when we deploy the contract, we set that to one non-zero value. So what this results is that the root zero is active after timestamp one. And all messages are proven under the root zero. So all messages are proven against an active truth. So what the users did, they forged messages that were meant to the bridge, that told the bridge, hey, under all that collateral, and see any arbitrary message that has not already been proven, is proven under the root zero, they could prove and process whatever they wanted. And that's right there, 190 million bug. So why did it come up now, right? The Nomad protocol has been active for months. We had an upgrade. And during the upgrade, we changed the semantics of the second mapping. So we used to store an enum here, right? Numbers, numbers. So if the number is one, it's proven. If the number is two, it's processed. So we didn't connect messages to the roots under, the, under which they are proven, right? So even if uh, the root was active, uh, we, you know, through the authentication flow, we made sure that uh, we didn't authenticate that but we changed the, um, the semantics. And that is why the bug was so hard to find, uh, or testing didn't find it, or auditors didn't find it, because it needed the old state with a new code. So old state with old code, secure. New state with new code, secure. Old state with new code, not secure. Nomad now. Now the protocol is paused. Um, we'll restart the bridge, that's the hard part. How do we restart an uncollateralized bridge? Uh, we'll be sharing more information soon. Uh, the TLDR is that users will be able to access, uh, to collect some of the recovered funds as the recovered funds uh, continuously flow into the bridge. And they will do so fairly. Uh, you'll be able to read more about it in our coming weeks in our blog posts and Twitter accounts. So what did we learn? What did we learn from this? Um, I like history. Uh, Bismarck says that stupid people learn from their own mistakes. Uh, wise people learn from the mistakes of others. So be wise. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about not improvise and that and overcome. Uh, but we'll talk about test, observe, engage, and communicate. 
you can think about as different layers in the defenses of a castle, right? Uh, hopefully, uh, these layers of defense uh, will stop the, the attackers from reaching the citadel, uh, the king or queen. It's like the Tweetsies analogy, uh, security. I'm, I'm sure most of your, uh, you researchers will know about that security um, analogy, but I think castles are way cooler than cheese. So that's why I prefer to do castles. Yes, the, the bread and butter of every developer, right? Um, there are, although there weren't any best practices, uh, I think the industry is now uh, slowly aligning on these, um, on some, you know, best practice on this. So we're having the unit tests, property-based tests, integration tests, forking tests, and invariant tests. And I want to go a quick rundown through them. First of all, concrete tests, super simple. I want to make sure that the function, uh, if I give it five, I will get 25. We also name it concrete function, uh, concrete tests. Property-based tests are more advanced. Um, they force you to think about the properties of your code. So basically, to, to verify that this function will give uh, the input multiplied by five, always. Then we have the integration test, where we want to test bigger picture, uh, features, user flows. Um, forking test, which is like a web-free uh, specialty. All the other tests, you can find them in other paradigms. A forking test basically could be uh, an integration test or a unit test, but we test against the on-chain state. And this is very uh, important because, as you saw, a bug can surface itself only uh, using the on-chain state. And finally, variant tests, my personal favorite. Uh, invariants are these um, equations, phrases, that should always hold for your protocol, right? If that phrase doesn't hold at some point, the protocol is, should be paused. The protocol has broken in some way. So this is a big project. Uh, you'll do it in two phases. First phase, you will define the invariants. So it's a very theoretical uh, phase, not easy. Definitely, and then it's testing the variants using any tools. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there. For example, in Nomad, the invariant that broke was that all messages that are processed, right, received, must have been sent. People were processing messages that were never sent. This invariant broke. And finally, uh, I would like to mention static analysis tools. Um, this could be very useful, uh, especially for uh, newer developers, as they can find some simple vulnerabilities, and storage layout analysis. Uh, basically, you can use tools to verify that the storage layout of your upgradable contracts will not change uh, without you noticing. And this is a very common um, source of vulnerabilities. In my view, uh, you should prioritize unit tests, obviously, uh, property-based tests, um, and forking tests. This should be uh, your primary focus with Tools like Foundry, Foundry, uh, it's very, I think it's easier than it used to be. Of course, you should always audit, you know, use a, do an audit, although it's not a silver bullet, so don't just do audits. And of course, always check the storage layout, always. Uh, observe, the second pillar, now we have tested, alerting. If you receive a UAP message and you aren't already up, it's too late, like your alerting has failed shouldn't wait from a certain Twitter account to tell you that there's a problem with your protocol. Uh, this is a, a solved problem in Web2. Web3 would like to invent things again and again, but it's a solved problem in Web2. So go and read the Google SRE handbook. You'll get a ton of input. Also, talk with your DevOps engineers. If they have worked in Web2 before, they will have a lot of insights for you. Uh, you should start with an object, uh, you know, the business objective and then define actionable alerts. Actionable, that's the key word, actionable. That means that if an alert A is activated, then you should do B. It should be a very simple if, the, if then, uh, you know, close. You should have a playbook for every alert. So if alert A happens, you should do that, and that's the way you should do it, and here's the script you should run. Super simple. If you don't do that, you will get alert fatigue because you'll start not paying attention to alerts, because you know, it's not that important. And by not paying attention, you will miss that alert that will erect your protocol. Um, a nice mental model for alerts in Web3, I think, is uh, heuristics and environment-based alerts. Heuristics are rules. Uh, they require human intervention to make 
to understand whether that's a false positive or not. Uh, Environment-based alerts, uh, where you have an off-chain agent um, running and continuously checking the variance of the protocol. Uh, more complex, but can be automated, because invariants shouldn't produce false positives. Like, if the invariant alert is on, that means that either you didn't define the invariant properly, or B, protocol is um, broken. In other way, probably it's a good thing to pause the protocol. Now, engage. Testing has failed, alerting, mm, maybe. So now we're in the engaging. We are in the first minutes of the, of the incident. What do we do? Uh, a poet, Arhilo, who told us that we do not rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. So if you don't have, don't have an incident um, playbook, if you haven't gone through that, you will not be able to uh, you know, act appropriately, and you will get wrecked even if your alerting was good. So a good uh, incident management means explicit ownership. Very specific persons should have very specific ownership of the management, of the incident. Outcomes. Every person should know what should be the outcome of their work during an incident. Game day, game day, game day. Do that again and again. Go through simulations. The entire organization should create game days for these incidents. Because they will happen. They will happen. And you shouldn't be, uh, you know, during the incident, you, should, you shouldn't read the incident playbook for the first time. Uh, Yearn internally has a very nice blog post about it. I highly suggest you look at it and you adapt it to your organization. We didn't engage in proper, in proper time. We lost money, right? So it's now time to face the music. What do we do? I'm sure everyone would like, yeah, let's talk to the users. You know, we have to be transparent. We have to tell them what happened. We have to be, you know, uh, tell them before they, re they read it and wrecked. No. Nope. You shouldn't talk to anyone. You should talk to your legal team. You don't do a commit. You don't do a tweet. You don't to your mother. If you don't do with your lawyers. You should think about what the users want but you should talk with your lawyers first. When you do communicate, you should be honest. No sugar coating, you know, you just uh, insult them. You should have pre-approved messaging because that's easier. Like during a crisis, after the first hours, you're shaking, you haven't slept, you're high on caffeine, you can't properly create you know, a communication or a PR uh, output. You should tell them what you do, what are you doing right now, and what you plan to do. Let's see a quick timeline of the first days after an incident. First of all, we talk with our lawyers and we inform them of the situation so they can start talking with uh, law enforcement agencies for asset recovery. We do the first batch of public communication. We tell them what happened, um, what do we want to do, what we are planning to do. We talk, we talk with our partners, ideally through more uh, privileged communication group like Telegram, Maybe we can share it more than we share with the public because of NDAs and all that. Uh, because as you are losing money, they are losing as well. Then you should talk with a chain analytics firm. That is very important. I will tell you why. Because apparently people, they suddenly have a change of heart when legal enforcement agencies are zeroing in on your, their real identities, right? Suddenly they just want to return the funds back. And the only reason uh, and the only way for, uh, to recover assets is using a chain analytics firm that will go on and analyze all these transactions and find correlations. And they will be able to point uh, the law enforcement agencies to centralized exchanges so they can freeze funds and request um, data, personal data. So if you want to recover your assets, you will need a, a chain analytics firm. Then you will uh, set up a recovery address where you can, um, you will uh, start uh, collect the funds and align with your team on the bounty. And of course, the bounty has many legal externalities. So again, your lawyers will be your best friends. <laughs>